And we're back. I'm pleased to introduce Laura Shin and Gavin Wood for the closing fireside chat. I have my fire over here. I'm going to go sit by it and watch. I hope you all do too. Take it away, gang. Hi, Gavin. Hi, Laura. Nice to see you again. Likewise. All right. So let's have a discussion about all things Polkadot. Let's start with a really basic question. What is your vision for Polkadot? When you conceived of it, what problems were you trying to solve? Um, the, well, there are many sort of answers, uh, to this question. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, in many, in many respects, it was a very abstract thing that I wanted to do when I started Polkadot. It was a, um, really just a push to become more abstract, more general over, um, over what it was that we were solving, uh, what it was that we were uh, producing. So it's like, you know, Bitcoin started off with a very basic scripting language. Ethereum sort of introduced this much more um, complete um, means of, of scripting financial transactions. Um, and really with Polkadot, it was uh, trying to create something that uh, uh, produced like an even more general model for how um, how, how it can be extended, um, how things can be added. Um, and then on top of that, it was really also trying to address this, you know, fundamental problem of scalability. Like, how do we try and push through more transactions? How do we take advantage of the fact that there's an awful lot of workers out there on the network? Um, but uh, it's so wasteful to have them all working on the same thing. Um, so it was it was these twin sort of topics, these this generality and uh, and and scalability. And really, the the vision was was just to sort of make blockchain great again. It's like, can we take blockchain to its, um, uh, you know, a step further? Um, can we actually address some of these really uh, important issues that we've always known have existed? Um, you don't have, you know, you can go really quite far back, five, 10 years, um, and see that people are already thinking, well, we really need to like, you know, process different transactions on different nodes. We really need to be more general. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it, it was really just kind of, can we can we bring this forward? Can we be more general? Can we process more uh, transactions on different nodes? And when you say the words general and abstract, um, I'm not really sure what you mean. You've also talked about how Polkadot is a meta protocol. Are those concepts related? And can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, uh, they are. They are. So a meta protocol is, um, it's like a, a Meta means sort of after or beyond, and it's generally used to mean like um, the next sort of step down uh, past this concept. So it's like, you know, um, a meta protocol is a protocol that um, governs another protocol, a protocol on which you can place another protocol. It's like um, a protocol of a protocol, or protocol of protocols. Um, and what I mean by meta protocol in this sense, really, is uh, that it's an underlying kind of much more basic, much simpler um, protocol on which we build what we would normally consider to be the protocol. So to take an example, um, the protocol of, of, of Bitcoin is, well, we send blocks around and these blocks, when you uh, execute them, uh, when you when you interpret the blocks or the transactions in them, um, there are, you know, uh, transactions with like some script, but basically most of the time it means send these Bitcoins to these addresses. Um, and that's that's a protocol. We under, like the nodes of the Bitcoin network understand how to in, interpret these blocks, right? It's language basically. Um, but it's very difficult. Once you've set that language, it's kind of set in stone. It's very difficult to, to alter it, to change it, to introduce additional features, um, to fix bugs. Um, and uh, as, you know, it's like it's 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 very rigid. Um, a meta protocol would sit underneath that protocol and define that protocol. And the nice thing is that because um, because it's defined in terms of this meta protocol, then you can change it quite easily. You just have to obey the rules of the meta protocol, and then the main protocol can can adapt and evolve and iterate over time. So then the question is, well, why is that, you know, what if you need to adapt, evolve and iterate on the meta protocol? Um, and the, the idea with that is that we make it as simple 
um, and as, uh, as abstract as possible. We take a pre-existing technology, something that has already kind of been iterated through, something that very clever people uh, from many different sort of um, stakeholders have already argued about and sort of come to the decision that this is probably the best thing that does this kind of meta protocolistic stuff and and what we did was well we we chose uh, basically webassembly because webassembly is like an industry standard um it's been iterated on it it's actually the already uh, two separate technologies one built by mozilla one built by google has sort of been plunged together into this um, into this thing webassembly um so it, it's already got a lot of ideas it's already had a lot of iterations um it's unlikely that we're ever really going to need to change it and therefore it's it's really good foundation to build our stuff on met this meta protocol and then we just have to define everything else in terms of that and that's where the protocol comes in so the real polka dot protocol parachains and governance and balancing and dot protocol and staking all of this stuff is the polka dot protocol and that stuff changes over time, but it's defined in terms of the meta protocol that doesn't really change over time. And that's that's the stuff that we that 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 we make sure that we've got this like tried and tested, um, uh, very uh, uh, sort of well understood, well known um, um, technology in like WebAssembly. So yeah, it's it. It is a lot about being flexible and abstract because this top level, the polka dot protocol, is not very abstract. I mean, it, it is, parachains are pretty good, but there's still a very, um, a very specific way of having different sort of shards. They're a specific way of scaling. They're a specific way of uh, like uh, having a market mechanism to claim them. Um, so it's it's still like opinionated as we would say there's still a lot of opinions involved in it whereas the web assembly isn't very opinionated at all it's not even our opinion it's someone else it's google's and mozilla's and microsoft's and all of their opinions really we just said right well you guys have had time to argue about what whose opinion is best uh, we'll take the answer and use it because we don't want to argue we just want to have something that's stable and that's that's sort of because of that it's it's a more abstract level that we can build things on so there is this like these dual um le levels the meta protocol very abstract very general doesn't change very much and the protocol um, much more um much more opinionated more specific changes a lot because we don't you know our opinions are always wrong in the fullness of time opinions are always on they always need changing design always needs changing it it, it, it iterates over time and we want to allow ourselves to evolve and that's why having these two separate um protocols the meta protocol on the bottom the protocol building on top of it is uh, is how we achieve that and it's the same with with um it's the same how we get from bitcoin to ethereum to polka dot um there is this um idea of like well with with bitcoin it wasn't really programmable with ethereum it was kind of programmable but you had this very limited computation model with gas and dynamic gas pricing and dynamic uh, counting of resources and limited memory and storage and, and it was all very expensive um and that all that changes with the computation model in polka dot because we have parachains which are much more abstract much more general um in that they're not just a smart contract a, a, an easy little bit of code um that that sort of uh, keeps some records of maybe people's balances but rather an entire blockchain uh, that can basically kind of do more or less anything that you can imagine a blockchain to do and um, that that's a much more abstract thing for and i'll give you a concrete reason why that's an, a, an abstract thing you could easily implement a smart contract inside of a blockchain there already are blockchains that do it edgeware moonbeam a few others um you can't do it the other way around you can't implement a blockchain inside of a smart contract because it's there's just not enough computational power it's like you know you'd, you'd be like trying to shove a, a, a shoe inside of a foot you know it, it doesn't there's there's no you know it, it, it one can contain the other the other can't contain the one and and that's uh that's why you know it's we can say well look you know polka dot and the parachain model is is more general than the smart contract model um, now it doesn't mean it's better for all use cases in all circumstances, but it does mean that anything that you can do in a smart contract, you can do in a in a parachain, and but not the other way around. There's a lot of things that you can do in a parachain that you really can't 
or that at least, at the very least, would be extremely difficult to do in a smart contract. And you also have parathreads. Can you define those and differentiate them from the parachains? Yeah, so parachains, um, as a term, it's sort of, it's, it's evolved a little bit over time. But broadly speaking, parachains are these these slots. They're, they're like, um, there's, a, there's a, some number of them. Um, and they're a little bit like, um, compute like computer cores. So your computer has a bunch of cores. I mean, this this one that I'm on, I think, has four, but uh, some of them these days have six or eight or even more. Um, and the cores can process a particular application um, at once. So if you've got a bunch of windows open, um, then it might be that one of the cores is doing the video playing in one window, and another core is helping your web browser render the email in another window, and another core is playing your music in the background or whatever. Um, so they can do different workloads. But basically, parachains are are like this, but for for a blockchain. So they can do, they they do different workloads. One of them might be processing smart contract transactions. Another might be processing like balance transfers, like kind of Bitcoin transfer transactions. Another one might be doing governance. Another one might be calculating what the optimum staking situation is. Um, so it can do each of these cores, each of these para. Uh, parachains can do different things at any given time and we measure time in terms of blocks so it's like this particular block block number 1,470,293 um, is doing this it's doing um, it's got a staking parachain it's got a governance parachain it's got a two or three smart contract parachains and so on um, now para threads are when we say right well this application doesn't need to be processing transactions literally every block. Maybe it only needs to process transactions every 10th block, right? So instead of it happening every six seconds, it's every minute. Um, now that's perfectly reasonable. Bitcoin doesn't process transactions, you know, some of the time it takes an hour before the transactions go through, you know, on average it should be about 10 minutes. Um, so it's, it's not unreasonable to expect that probably one block uh, in every 10 is sufficient for quite a lot of use cases. So then we say, right, well, rather than having, rather than having the, this application just constantly, always um, uh, taking up one of these processing slots, um, even when maybe it doesn't have that many transactions to process, um, instead what we do is we say, right, well, you don't get any like by default, but when you're ready to process some some transactions, when you've got a you've got a bunch in your queue and you, you've you, I don't know they're important enough or they've been waiting long enough or whatever, then um, you pay a bit of money, but only a little bit, and and they get processed. You sort of just push them bulk onto the onto the polka dot um, sort of network, um, and you get a block. It's like you get in one of these polka dot blocks. You get your block being processed. You get your block of transactions um, through. And uh, you gave an example of how Bitcoin only has a block every 10 minutes, but what types of projects do you see as wanting, like, you know, to be on a pair of thread as opposed to a pair of chain? Can you give some examples? Yeah, there's a, there's a few. So one of them would be an Oracle. So you can imagine there will be some Oracle um, situations that are feeding in data from the external world. Now, feeding in a load of data every six seconds seems overkill for a lot of, a lot. I mean, you know, if you're talking about weather data, you don't need to update the weather every six seconds, right? Um, maybe, I mean, maybe once a, um, an hour, I don't know, once a day. Um, but yeah, definitely not every six seconds. Um, you know, 500 raindrops have fallen, <laughs> 493 more raindrops have fallen. No. Um, so, you know, we can imagine that, that actually and with weather, it's like, you know, maybe once an hour, once every half hour tops. And, and it, it and maybe it doesn't matter whether it's you know literally thirty seconds to the uh, thirty minutes to the dot after the last update. Maybe it's okay for it to be like 30, 31 minutes after the last update. You know, there's no huge, um, uh, huge time um, um, uh, deadline, and that would be a really good one um, for para threads because you know they would just basically have um, some amount of of of, uh, of, of money or of, of tokens or whatever that they want to pay in order to get their new block of weather information, their update in. And uh, and then they just, you know, wait until the block, the, the chain of Polkadot is sufficiently unused, underutilized, and then they're, 
their block will go in a little bit like how transactions work in Bitcoin and Ethereum right now. So, you know, you've got your, um, you've got a transaction fee and maybe it sticks around for a block or two or three until a miner picks it up because there aren't enough other transactions that are paying more. So very similar in that regard, basically just a, a, an adaptive market. Another use case would be um, a, a regional um, applications. So it could be that there's like um, a, a, a US centric or a China centric um, insurance app. And it's like, look, people don't claim their insurance, well, mostly uh, at 4 a.m., right? Mostly any 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 shit that's going down <laughs> at 4 a.m. perhaps, but the insurance comes a day or two later in daylight hours. Um, and so realistically, for these kinds of, of, of regional daylight hour use cases, you're going to have like eight, 10 hours where it's, it's, it's people are going to use it. There's going to be transactions. Uh, but the rest of the day, the rest of the 24 hour period, um, there won't be very much going on. And it doesn't make sense, therefore, to have a, you know, have a, have a constantly scheduled parachain um, slot um, if, you know, 60% of the time it's not being used, no transactions. Right. Going. And what about parachains? What are the types of parachains that you're envisioning will exist? Well, I mean, it, it's going to be an ecosystem. So there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of different things all kind of helping each other um, to, uh, to to get to like the end use cases. Something that seems pretty clear is that we can't jump past this stage. Um, the magic of blockchain isn't really in delivering a specific use case. Uh, really well. We've had a lot of time to do that and nothing's really come through. Um, one or two minor exceptions, but more or less. Um, what Where we have seen uh, huge, uh, hugely promising developments is in the emergent effects of being able to combine multiple use cases um, that, uh, well, multiple applications, let's say, multiple sort of solutions. Um, in an environment where they can uh, they can form symbiotic relationships, build on top of each other, um, and provide a composite solution that no one ever really designed, but that that nonetheless um, uh, you know uh, fulfills some goal. So you know you've got the flash loans, you've got like the paycheck loans, you've seen the DeFi um, uh, 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 thing happening at the moment. That's that's kind of where I think. Um, where blockchain is is able to provide like a, a, a good step forward in providing these um, trustless environments where people can be very experimental and deploy um, interesting uh, um, use cases that are interesting applications, interesting you know bits of code that build upon that that form symbiotic relationships with pre-existing bits of code and that allow others to build upon that. Um, so this this is what we call composition. It's what we call you know emergent effects, and I think uh, I think that's really where things are going to go. So what what kind of parachains? I mean, you know, there's going to be parachains that want to specialize in uh, smart contracts for sure, um, just because they're an easier way of developing and deploying stuff than a full blown blockchain. Um, though interestingly enough, not that much easier. Um, I think we're going to see different um, different blockchains that come with uh, kind of niche um, uh, niche applications that they provide, plus a smart contract component that allows people to sort of extend those applications. So at the moment, we have in in chains like Ethereum, we have a lot of um, a, lot, a lot of smart contracts deployed into them, each one fulfilling a particular niche, um, but None of them are none of them are particularly performant. None of them scale well. None of them are really utilizing um, the computational power of the machines. What I think we're going to end up with is having um, the smart contract environment primarily used for extent extension, like extending the functionality of things, um, but where the 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 blockchain itself provides um, the sort of really bread and butter logic for you know doing flash loans for doing decentralized exchanges um for transferring funds um for governance voting functions um this is this i think is gonna um, migrate to a more fixed um part of the blockchain like like 
basically what Substrate provides to you. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the smart contracts, the sort of fastest, fast iteration on the smart contracts, uh, where people can develop and deploy very quickly, will um, will be for more um, experimental, extent, extensible stuff. So I think we're going to have a lot of smart, a lot of different flavor smart contract chains, um, doing things, you know, super diverse stuff. Um, uh, we're going to have Oracle chains, like we're going to be chains that are sp very um, specialized to just have data pumped into them. There'll be chains that actuate stuff, I think. Um, so, you know, Slock it, I don't know, they're not really doing much anymore, but uh, as far as I know, sorry if if, if you are, guys. They were uh, acquired by Blockchains LLC. Right, yeah. Um, so, you know, but good example of an actuator where they're actually, you know, um, the, the transactions on a blockchain are having effects in the physical world. I think we will see these kinds of, um, these kinds of things uh, growing, you know, whether it's, I mean, maybe it's home automation. Maybe there's a blockchain that, that you know, its transactions are like, turn my light on, turn my light off. And the advantage of using a blockchain is you get like an indelible ledger of who told your lights to turn on and off, making it sort of more secure, making it, you know. But regardless, you know, actuation uh, blockchains um, may well uh, become a thing. I, I mean, obviously there's uh, things like consortium blockchains, uh, blockchains that, uh, parachains that bring together other um, uh, sets of blockchains. Um, uh, we're going to have bridge chains that allow uh, blockchains to connect. Uh, well, Polkadot and its parachains to connect to other networks. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be a lot. Okay. Well, one other thing that I was wondering about parachains is when I was doing the research for this, I was kind of interested to see that they have expiration dates unless they're extended. And if they do expire, they go through this retirement period and those who contributed to the crowdfunding get their dots back. But I just wondered, so what happens to the smart contracts and other apps on that parachain? Because like, you know, on Ethereum, these programs are usually unstoppable. So yeah. for instance, an Oracle on Ethereum will always have a price. So in the case of these parachains, would people simply not build things on Polkadot such as Oracles or any other functions that they would expect to exist beyond that time horizon of you know, like six months or two years or whatever it is. Yeah. Well. Okay. So the retirement is is an interesting um, thing. So it, it back I don't know two three years ago um, it didn't really have a great answer to this question. It was sort of like, well, if they're useful, then they'll just have to pay. You know. Um, but yeah, uh, about a year and a half ago, we came up with Parathreads. I think it was a year and a half ago. Maybe it was only a year ago. Um, and no, it was a year. Yeah, it's twenty twenty. Yeah, a year and a half ago. Um, and parathreads, um, as I mentioned, are these like pay-as-you-go block, uh, pay-as-you-go parachains, right? So it's like it, they, they don't they don't do much unless you sort of fund them, um, uh, but you only pay for one block at a time. So you only need a few transactions that are um, willing to, you know, are, are paying enough that the rest of the Polkadot network doesn't desperately want to use all of the parathread slots. And to give some, like, I would expect. There will probably be about 50 free slots for power threads every six seconds. So I think okay. when the calculations are done, it's like for for each power thread to get one block in every, I don't know, 10 minutes, then it's like you can have the 3,000 or 10,000 or something um, power threads that are kind of mostly active. Um, so it's it, they're going to be reasonably cheap. Now the idea is that when your block, when your parachain, if your parachain is sufficiently unuseful that you know you can't collect together the funds for renewing your slot, um, and it's not that this happens overnight, right? You get eighteen months in principle. You get eight, an, eight, an eighteen month grace period. So you got one and a half years to convince people to make your token worth enough that you can swap enough of it for dots to pay for your parachain slot to lease out your parachain slot. Now, uh, and, and you get 18 months to actually secure that next six month period. So um, you'll you'll know very much ahead of time if this is coming. But that said, suppose for some reason you just can't scrape together the dots, then um, you don't just disappear 
in, in a puff of smoke um, with all of your Oracle data or anything. Your, your, your chain stays active, like it, 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 it sticks around, um, it's there. Um, an Oracle would t tend to use passive data transfer, which basically means you look at the relay chain to see what the last block was for, you, for that particular chain. And then you get one of the um, collators, one of the people who, who has the blockchain um, and, and its information to give you a proof um, that, uh, you know, uh, hey, what was the gold price? Um, most recently, and, and they'll come back with a proof that we'll use the data on the Polkadot relay chain plus some extra witness, some extra data um, that fits alongside that, and you plug them together, and you can now be sure that the price of gold, according to this parachain, was such and such. Now, um, this will still work. So an Oracle chain wouldn't actually stop working. Now, it just means that their updates wouldn't necessarily be every six seconds. It would be as often as um, as it's willing to pay for its updates. Um, and that's that's basically how it works. It's like, you, you know, when you've had a mobile phone contract and it's like, you know, you're, you're paying per month and, and you're paying like $50 a month. And it's like, yeah, at the beginning it's okay. But then it, it kind of drags on, it drags on. And you're thinking, I'm not actually using this $50 a month subscription that much. Um, it's not that useful to me. Um, so you, you tell them, look, I want to cancel my subscription. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, if we can't persuade you not to keep your subscription, then I'll tell you what, you can keep the number, but you'll go on like the pay as you go tariff, right? So basically um, just make sure you put, a, a you know, Twenty dollars on every six months, and you'll you know you'll be fine. We'll, we'll keep your number active. You can still receive calls and, and all that. Basically, it's exactly the same with Polkadot. If once once your subscription ends, if it ends, um, then you just go directly onto the pay as you go version tariff, and you block. You you can still keep your chain going. You just have to pay per block. Okay, and and um, does, do you get finality with each block? Yeah, because it's it's the same. It's exactly it's like the same technology, like hundred percent. Okay, so one other thing um, that I wanted to ask about a lot of people, I, I solicited questions on Twitter, and people were curious to know how the parachain auctions will be run and when you'll have them. Well, interesting question. Yeah, um, I, it's it's really difficult to say because our the auctions for parachains. I don't I don't really want to start the auctions for parachains until pretty solidly sure that we know when the parachains are going to start because as soon as you start the auctions you're taking you know people are locking up their their dots and it's like well yeah it might be next week it might be next year it's not a great like you know thing to be locking up your dots on right so um parachain auctions are going to start once we um once we basically have tested parachains on whichever network they're, they're on. So, you know, we've got Kusama and Polkadot. We, we roll them out to Kusama first because Polkadot, we, we don't um, push code on that isn't audited externally by our security uh, company. Um, so Kusama will get the unaudited code that we're still reasonably sure is, is okay, but, you know, unaudited. So, you know, take Right. Take and it, just for listeners who aren't sure what Kasama is, Kasama is basically the test network, but there's actual real value being staked on it. And the token, the KSM token it has real value. So um, the incentives are all there. And it's like a kind of a true test environment uh, where you can actually see how the incentives will affect the ecosystem. Um, well, but so before you get into all that, like, do you want to also talk about the uh, candle auctions? Because I think people would be curious to know about those. Sure. Well, now, basically, um, the way that the, the these auctions work is um, is that we we didn't want to. So blockchains necessarily are these like super open and transparent things. Everyone can see what's going on um, uh, all the time. And what we what we didn't want was to have, you know, this way this this game like this this sort of auction game where you know, I don't know if you ever used eBay. I mean, I you know I, I don't know is it used these days or is everyone just using Amazon? I, I mean, I haven't used it in years, but like back, <laughs> back in the, you know the early days of Web two, I was I was an avid eBayer, um, like you know sort of two thousand five ish, like, like two thousand seven that, that sort of thing, and. Um, and what inevitably happened was the last 60 seconds, you know, the, the price would be, you know, $5, <laughs> um, slowly climbing up from $3, $3, $4, $3, 45 
Um, and it gets to like $5. And then the last 60 seconds, it'd be like 10, 15, 50, 500. <laughs> it's like, okay, right. So it was a 10 day auction, but actually all of the important bids happened in the last minute. Um, now that's, that, that's a pretty standard kind of game theoretic thing to do. You basically hold your best bid for the very last point in the auction. Um, and it's, it's, kind of rubbish for to do that for a blockchain because it, it means that you it, it's not great price discovery people if you hold it for the last minute then it's like it, it, you might not get it in uh, miners validators can kind of keep them back you know and 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 if if a few bad validators happen to have the last few blocks then you know maybe a good price will 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 we'll get um chucked for for a bad one um it it's it's sort of fraught with with problems. Um, what so what we wanted to do was was find a solution for this. It turns out there was already a solution. Hurrah! Um, history has provided us one. Um, so there are these auctions called candle auctions. Um, they're they're named so because they basically the auctioneer had a candle next to them, and uh, the candle was lit at the beginning of the auction. People could 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 put bids in. It was an open auction, so anyone can bid anything at any time as long as it's higher than the previous highest bid. Um, but when the candle goes out, then regardless of whether anyone's got any more bids to add, um, that, that last bid is the bid that, that wins. Yeah. So it's a really good way of making sure that auctions don't go on forever and that there isn't like a group of people, like a cabal of people with much higher bids that are just waiting and waiting and waiting until, uh, everyone else has, has done their thing. Um, now, the problem with candle auctions is that uh, you can't put a candle on a blockchain. You can't even put like an abstract representation of a candle on a blockchain uh, because you can't end something randomly um, very, uh, uh, very easily. Basically, um, to end something randomly, someone has to know when it's going to end because someone has to model the candle. Someone has to like be the the generator for the candle. Is like, is the flame gone out yet? And if the, someone's the generator, it means they've got an advantage. So what instead we do is we do this clever thing where we have a retroactive ending. So the auction ends at the end of some hour, right? We Time is broken up into hours. And at the end of some hour, we say the auction's ended. But it doesn't literally end at that hour instead it ends at some point in the previous hour so we know it's ended sometime in the last hour but we don't know when yet and then we choose a point randomly in that last hour and that point is when uh, the auction ended which means there have been possibly other higher bids that have come in since that point because you know we're at the end of the hour right um but we discard them and what this means is that even um things like smart contracts that you can very easily predict the behavior of um, can still have a, a, a good chance of getting a, uh, a a slot because even though I might instantly see the smart contract bid and then bid one higher in the next block, um, it can't, it might be that, well, then the smart contract maybe bids up in the block after that and I bid. So I might be in a bidding war with a smart contract, but that still means that every other block, the smart contract uh, will um, will be the winning one at that point. And then it's like a 50-50 chance, whether it's the smart contract or me, because it's a block chosen at random in the last hour. So it might be one where the smart contract was winning, but it might be one where I'm winning. Now, normally you wouldn't be able to do that because uh, I would just always be checking the smart contract, bidding one up, and by the time it ended, I would, I would be bidding one beyond the smart contract. But because we end at a random time, um, we can uh, we can avoid that problem. And one other thing that I was curious about is that each parachain is paid for via this auction. Mm. Um, and as far as I understand, there isn't payment for gas metering. So then how do you prevent DDoS attacks on a specific parachain? Yeah, it's uh, basically we leave it as a problem for the parachain. Um, it's We don't want to force parachains into a particular uh, model for how they measure or charge for their transactions. Um, what we instead do is say, well, look, enough validators must um, agree that your block, your parachain block um, is verifiable, validatable, executable, basically can be, can be, can be um, run um, 
in a particular period. Two seconds, I think, at the moment. So it's like a third of the six second um, block time. Um, and as long as that's the case, then we don't care how you how you uh, you know how you manage your transactions, how you manage your users, how you manage any of your blockchain logic to make it sure it fits in the two seconds. If for some reason it doesn't, then it's the block isn't going to get in, and maybe you, your next block it will get in. Um, maybe some some other collator, some other uh, block producer will will come up with a block that that takes less than two seconds. Um, but the point is that. Um, we we don't we want to be more abstract, more general. So a more general way of than counting gas, which is a very specific way of of working out how to make sure that blocks don't take too long, that you don't get DDoSed. Um, a more general way is just to say, well, well, we don't care. Like as long as it happens in two seconds, we don't care how you how you manage it. So alternative ways of managing it would just be to have voting, for example, or to not have transactions, or to have transactions but have a very simple way of measuring, not not gas, just saying, well, there's only one kind of transaction, transfer transactions. So it might be like a plasma kind of chain where it's just you know super um, uh, transfer oriented, and we um, and we don't we know that every transfer only takes however many. 0.1 of a millisecond or something. Um, and we we just make sure that you can't have more than 20, 25, 10,000, 20,000, 20 million, 20,000, 20,000 uh, of them in a, uh, yeah, that's right, in a, uh, in a block. And, you know, then you don't need gas counting. You don't need dynamic uh, resource um, uh, measurement. Now, of course, for smart contracts, if you want to have smart contracts be very um, general and very deterministic, then you probably still want this. But the point is that you don't need it in every circumstance, and there are lots of use cases where you know, but more simple than the, uh, uh, than the smart contract use case, where you really don't need that level of complexity um, and the performance hit that you take from it. So by okay. putting, by allowing um, uh, blockchain parachains to decide their own way of being of keeping this two second enforcement um we allow them to um uh, we allow them all sorts of, of more um, um flexibility uh, and potentially performance benefit okay you've come up with a concept called initial parachain offerings how do these differ from initial coin offerings and also, in particular, how do these avoid the regulatory problems that ICOs had in the U.S.? Uh, well, you know, we we, we don't really um, uh, um, we haven't done much legal research on on. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I I think we're trying to. I think they're now PL PLOs or something parachain lease offerings. But anyway. Oh, uh, okay, okay. You know, well, IPO is kind like of token always, generation yeah. event. It's like trying to. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, not to not sound like IPO, but anyway, okay. Yeah. Well, why don't, but why don't you describe what they are? Um, but yeah, so I, 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 the thing about parachain leases is um, we call it like crowd loaning. So it's like crowdfunding, but instead of instead of just handing over your 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 hard earned cash um, and getting I don't know something back, maybe a product or a token or whatever, um, it's only a loan. So you lock up your um, your dots or your kusama. Same on Kusama, um, for some period of time, um, and you can choose like um, well, you know ahead of time how long it is, so that, that you don't choose yourself. Rather, the the team chooses. They might say, "Well, we only need it for six months. After six months, we'll have launched our token. We'll have uh, we'll we'll have users. Uh, we'll be very clearly a good use case, um, and we will then work out other funding mechanisms. Probably selling our own tokens into whatever market it is." Um, and uh, and uh, for dots, and then using those dots, um, that would be a, a pretty obvious way of doing it, I'd say. Uh, but that initial six months, you probably you may well need to go to um, uh, go to others, go to dot holders, and say, look, you know, loan us the loan us the dots for a lease, would you, please? Um, and that's what this is for. So it's crowd loan. You're asking dot holders to put their dots in for a fixed period of time. Now this loan, this crowd loan. Um, is kind of a bit like staking. It's handled entirely by the Polkadot relay chain, and then probably over time that will migrate into a parachain because we don't really want all of this complex stuff on, on the relay chain. Um, but you don't have to trust the team 
with it. That's the main thing, right? You're loaning the dots into Polkadot, the relay chain, and it's they just get kind of reserved. They don't even really leave your account. They're still kind of on your account. Um, and they're certainly still on the chain. And you can always check the logic of the chain to see, yes, they're, they're very much associated with the account. You have three and a half months to go. Then they'll be uh, back spendable by you uh, from your account. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's like, it's a bit like using the staking system. The only um, the only difference is they're not producing any returns like they do with the staking system. Um, but presumably, the team that is that has asked you to loan um, these uh, these dots for their initial parachain or their, their parachain lease um, are, are planning to reward your contribution, your loan with. Um, well, I don't know, something on their chain. Perhaps one might imagine some of their own tokens, but I mean, I, I don't want to straight jacket these guys. Maybe they've got some other thing going on. Maybe it's a, a, a I don't know, an, an NFT chain and they're giving you a, a free tickets to a, a, a gig. I don't know. Who knows? It could be all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, main, main takeaway is um, there is no transfer a value in this, right? You know, they're not no the team isn't getting anything from from the crowd, right? The crowd are just kind of locking up their tokens um with a guarantee, guaranteed by the protocol that these tokens are coming back in a particular time period. Now, again, we haven't consulted uh any one of any note, <laughs> legal or otherwise, on this um and, and how it might be different, but um you know, in my uh, layman opinion, uh, I I would think that uh, the having uh, you know having just it literally be um, locking up some tokens for some period that you definitely get back later with zero risk or zero additional risk um, isn't really uh, kind of anything. You know, it's 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 like staking, and and that's not really a. A thing, right? It's, it's just you know, the rewarding is a thing, perhaps, and and might have some knock-on effect. But but locking something up, you know, it's not a thing, as opposed to value transfer into some other entity, which very much is a thing. That's a that's a definite right. thing. Um, so I, I think by moving away from the value transfer into into a guaranteed um, kind of lockup situation um, with a guaranteed return and lockup date. Um, I think uh, that may well uh, move it into a um, to be viewed by various organizations as a um, as a non-event, basically. Okay. Well, there are people who work at the SEC who listen to my show, so yeah. we may find out. Um, so, Polkadot has on-chain governance. Can you do a brief description of how that works? One yeah. one thing that I find interesting about it is that uh, proposals that pass get automatically executed, and your theory is that this will prevent forks, which I find fascinating. So maybe you can also talk about that. Uh, sure. Uh, well, okay. So let's. Um, so we've got. Let's let's um, move this from the meta protocol. So I mentioned earlier, you got this meta protocol, right? WebAssembly, this like low level um, language, basically, it's a machine language. Um, on which we can describe and define the Polkadot protocol and the Kusama protocol and the Edgeware protocol and the Moonbeam protocol and the, the I don't know, Centrifuge protocol, the Carla protocol, mm -hmm. all these protocols, right? Um, and they're all built on this meta protocol, this WebAssembly-based meta protocol. Now, you've got a problem. The problem is, how do you know when to change a protocol? Like, what, what governs that? What, what decides that? So you can say, well, you know, there's there's um, a team and they've got a CEO and the CEO has a key and they can just change the protocol with a key. But, you know, it's not really in the spirit of decentralized um, uh, uh, blockchain kind of, kind of um, uh, scene, is it? It's, uh, it's not a very good answer. Um, and of course, it has its big problems, which is, well, what if the CEO loses their key? What if, um, what if the CEO goes mad? Um, uh, uh, what if... Uh, Whatever. Whatever gets stolen. So we need a better way. And normally we decentralize this decision making criteria. So we have multi signatures, we have voting, we, we try and you know bring it out, pluralize um, uh, the mechanism. Now that's all that's all well and good, but then how do you make sure that um, this mechanism is respected? Like if it's more than just literally a single key that is trivial to sort of respect. 
Um, you can build it into the software, for example. Um, then how do we ensure that, that everyone is on the same page? And we have this consensus problem. So this is where, this is another reason why we have a meta protocol. The meta protocol allows for us to alter the protocol according to the rules of the protocol. And that's where we have this, um, the governance, sure, but also the, um, the enactment of the decision coming from the governance. Um, I mean, you know, we have like, uh, we have this, this situation in the, in the U S at the moment with, uh, you know, a lack of consensus on the one side, uh, which is most of the news outlets, um, I don't know, 74%, 80%, whatever of the population. And, um, I don't know, every, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of people on Twitter, uh, all saying, oh, well, obviously Joe Biden won the election. Um, and then on the other side, you've got um, you've got the president himself and um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, voices behind him uh, saying, well, actually, no, he didn't. Uh, Trump won the election. Um, we have a lack of consensus over the governance process itself, um, and this uh, this obviously um, is problematic um, and kind of problematic. Kind of kind of one of the ways because the reason it's problematic is because the the you know it's not clear. People are asking, well, what exactly governs the transition <laughs> process? How do we know when, like, who should be the next person? If there, if there isn't consensus, um, who makes sure that the government is indeed the government that was that was elected if we can't decide who was elected? And there's there, there isn't, like, you know, is it just, well, whoever's in the White House governs? Well, that doesn't seem like, <laughs> what if... What if the current occupier doesn't want to leave the White House? Well, then what happens? We we have this constitutional crisis, and um, and this is why we need to. Um, this is why it's important to have um, absolute enactment. Like we, this is why it's important to tie the enactment of the decision to the decision making process itself, and make the decision making process a sort of um, uh, the enforcer, as it were. Or, or at least part of the enforcement. Um, now, we don't like there isn't like an, an independent election commission that um, has the power to to put to both you know um, manage the election and put in the new president. That that doesn't exist, right? It's sort of the well, the old president it just should get out of the way. Like it wasn't really answered by the, the people who drew up the constitution. It's like, of course the old president should just get out of the way. Um, Let's focus on Polkadot. I understand the analogy, but right, just, cool. yeah. Um, so anyway, um, the tying together the governance, the decision-making process and the means by which that pro the, the decision of that, that comes from that process should be enacted is, is really critical in any system whether it's polka dot or, or anything else and that's what we're that's what we do and the reason that we can do it is because we have this meta protocol layer the meta protocol doesn't change but it does govern and execute the decision making process so it's like um the meta protocol is the thing that sort of runs the governance system so people can vote on what they think the next iteration of polka dot should be or should do or how it should change uh, whether bugs should be fixed whether it should be whether it should be, I don't know, rescues or any kind of, um, uh, whatever, um, re remunerations, compensations, uh, out of order transfers, whatever it is. Um, but they that that meta protocol layer also governs what the protocol is, which means it can enact any of those decisions. Um, I mean, any is any is maybe. I don't want to, I want to tie myself up with words, but like <laughs> most, the vast, vast, vast majority of protocol changes that, that we can ever envisage the need to do, um, this meta protocol layer can allow for them to happen. And, and that means that we never come out of consensus. Now with, f just to compare that to other blockchain systems, you've got like forks. So you've got hard forks. That's how we change the, the, the means of consensus. That's how we change the protocol, right? Now the problem is that what if what if the system, what if we can't decide on it what if I don't know fifty five percent votes to go this way forty five percent votes to go that way well does it mean we should go with the fifty five percent well theoretically I mean 
yeah, I guess. I mean, it depends. What's the governance mechanism? What's the decision-making criterion? If there isn't one, if it's like, mm -hmm, weak consensus, <laughs> uh, then then there's no way of deciding. Yeah, you're in this kind of gray zone where, yeah, there's a, there's a majority, there's a strict majority, but there isn't like a way of actually deciding because no one's actually agreed on how we decide. Um, and this, that's, that's, you know, famously happened with ETH Classic. Uh, well, with Ethereum at the time, it was, there was no ETH Classic. Um, and 90% uh, of the voters, at least, wanted to, um, you know, do the rescue thing and 10% didn't. Um, and the 10% who didn't um, carried on regardless. And, uh, and, and hence ETH Classic was born. Um, and it's these schisms. I mean, you can argue, you can argue schisms are a good thing. I mean, I think it's a, a very, very questionable position to be in. Um, for sure, schisms are not a indefinitely good thing because you schism, you schism, you, you know, you schism into a thousand bazillion fragments. Um, then none of them are going to be very, like, you know, none of them are going to have any users. Um, right. So yeah, obviously. Yeah, maybe some things do get sufficiently big that, you know, and there's so many differing points of view or, or maybe two very large camps um, that are sufficiently different in their outlook that you kind of do need to um, do need to fragment a little. But um, schisms cannot solve everything. And um, if indeed they solve anything and it's this is a the way that we avoid schisms is by allowing people to come together to have a forum where opinions can be aired um, and then to have a decision-making mechanism that everybody buys into and everyone is behind um, the eventual outcome of. And that's why that's why democracies have not, you know, schismed and schismed and schismed over the centuries that we've had them. Um, it's because we have, you know, we have elections and, and people accept that, you know, in an election, um, you have your you have your vote. You have the time to you have a forum. You have the time to air your opinion. You have the time to listen to others' opinions. But at the end of the day, you vote, and then there's an outcome. And if the outcome isn't the same way that you voted, it's like maybe next time. But you right, still you accept the process. Um, let's also now talk about security. Parity has a history of well-known security lapses, namely the hacks of the Parity multi-sig wallet, the first of which resulted in the siphoning of funds for some major ICOs, and the second of which froze half a million ETH. Now the security for Polkadot will be managed by the base layer chain. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong there, then the security for all the parachains will be at risk. What do you say to people who are concerned about the security of, of Polkadot? Um, well, we, as a, um, as a company and as a team, um, we have altered quite a lot since, um, way back when, uh, we were doing, um, the parity wallet. I mean, most of that code was done in 2016 ish. Um, and parity at that point really had no, um, I mean, it, it, we were just, you know, giving out free software. It was, it was like, yeah, we're coding this stuff um, under the GPL, no warranty. You know, um, we didn't have uh, the resources to be doing, you know, huge amounts of auditing. We didn't have the resources to be paying very expensive. I would add, external teams, um, uh, external experts at security um, to be looking at this stuff. So really, it was like a quid pro quo. It's like, look, the code's here, but you've got to kind of look at it um now with polka dot that's uh obviously changed a little we um, um we have had some uh, not insubstantial um income from the um from this the, the crowd sale um or the well, private actually sale that we've been doing um and so it's um with this, uh, we actually have the resources to do um, sort of proper, um, both internal audits, which I actually think are really very important. Um, and often will show, because people internally have a usually a deeper understanding of the technologies involved, often show like um, some of the more tricky uh, books, uh, but also um, external audits and like the polka dot, um, code base itself went through, I think, four separate external audits from four top tier um, security auditors 
uh, including one uh, which was a red audit. So it's like basically this this kind of top level attack team who were just there attacking um, a. Uh, I think they were attacking Kosama actually. You know, they were actually trying to. I don't know if they were they were gonna black hat take it down. I don't think, <laughs> they were. Uh, but they were they were attempting to find holes in it, right? And um, uh, you know, ultimately, the delivery of software comes down to confidence. How confident are you that that what you're delivering is reasonably bug free? Um, and you know, you can never be a hundred percent confident. It, it's it's too complicated. It's like, I mean, Polka dot in particular is really quite complicated, uh, more so than Ethereum. But regardless, it's still even even big, even Ethereum, even like relatively constrained pieces of, of software um, contain bugs because they're built by people and people make mistakes and people make mistakes when they're looking at other people's stuff and teams of people make mistakes. You can queue up a hundred coders and ask them to find bugs in a particular um, piece of software, but you know, there will there will probably be bugs left after all 100 have had a look at them. Um, if you are on um, utterly like mission critical um, uh, uh, systems programming, then you'll probably have multiple teams each independently implementing stuff, and you'll you'll have some way of like combining all of their implementations such that any individual bug doesn't actually result in 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 the problem manifesting itself. Um, now. And that's that's also a, uh, an avenue that we've gone down. We have two external um, teams, uh, so not Parity, um, um, other completely other teams, Chainsafe and Soromitsu, um, that are implementing Polkadot in, uh, independently from us. So we're going down that route as well. We've got like huge amounts of external audits. Uh, uh, we have a continuous external audit process. Um, so we actually have um, uh, uh, a company. Um, one of our um, basically the, the security company that were the, one of the four that, that we had um, audit Polkadot in the first place, constantly auditing the Polkadot code base, constantly looking out for bugs, checking new code. We have a rule that basically no new runtime code gets into Polkadot unless it's been audited. Um, the only uh, the only exception to that is if it's like really trivial, like basically you know a number changed or some variable was renamed. But basically, all code, all significant changes that go into Polkadot first have to get audited. Nothing goes on the chain until it's been audited. Um, so, I mean, you know, while I can't say, well, you know, Polkadot's bug free because it's a huge piece of software made by humans, um, it's we are now taking uh, every precaution that we reasonably can um, in order to make sure that. Um, uh, that that doesn't happen. Now, on top of that, we also have governance, which means that um, in principle, if we can agree that this was a bug and that it's, it, it really ought to be, you know, it has very clear, um, a very clear manifestation. Um, for example, someone's funds get locked indefinitely and, um, you know, you can't, you can't unlock them directly, but it's very clear that it's their funds. It's very clear that there is one key and only one key that controls these funds. Um, then it's and you can you know and and the governance of Polkadot, so the, the assembled stakeholders, um, whether it's through a referendum or via the council. Um, in in Polkadot's governance case, it's like both. It has to go via the council into a referendum. Then everyone gets a chance to vote on it. Um, if the assembled stakeholders decide that actually, yeah, we should fix this, we should, you know, whatever, unlock these funds or transfer it back or whatever it is, um, then it will happen. And that can't happen on chains without governance. Um, yeah, so, it sounds like this was born out of your experience with the frozen <laughs> funds on Ethereum. I mean, yeah, we all, <laughs> yeah, we all have our uh, drivers. Yeah. So speaking of Ethereum, Ethereum obviously is the leader at the moment in a kind of, you know, not maybe exactly the same space that Polkadot aims to compete in, but a very similar space. How do you view Polkadot as coexisting with Ethereum? Um, I mean, I, I, this this depends a lot on, um, on the driving uh, factors behind Ethereum. Um, I said very early on um, uh, in, in Polkadot's, I think it was like 20... 2018, I think it was the the dev the, the dot com. Um, Polkadot's a bet against or oh, the bet against blockchain maximalism. Like 
really with Polkadot. I wanted to make a network of networks. I didn't want to like be, um, I don't want to try and like solve all of the problems with one chain. I think Ethereum, uh, that certainly um, some of the um, some of the narrative surrounding Ethereum is there should only ever be one blockchain. There only ever needs to be one blockchain. That's Ethereum. Ethereum can host everything. Um, that's not a narrative that I ever really bought into, um, and um, and I, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's like a super like sensible narrative. Um, I, I think, uh, I think if, if, you know, Ethereum, um, ends up becoming a, a chain that, um, is sort of bridgeable, um, and I think, uh, I, I think that it's, there's a very good chance that Polkadot and Ethereum will, will just kind of, uh, happily sort of coexist with, um, logic and value flowing between the two um, uh, very easily. Um, now, looking at some of, uh, you know, we're already looking at, at ETH2's sort of specifications, consensus mechanism, um, and how it might eventually pan out, because, of course, ETH2 is um, only has its beacon chain at the moment. So there's no there's no state transitioning really on it. There's no there's certainly no shards or anything happening um, in that regard. So we've still got a long way to go before we can be sure precisely what if ETH2's eventual technical architecture will be. Um, but my hope is that it will become um, it will become something that we can very easily interface with, and uh, um, and then from in that way um, uh, have the two you know sort of cooperate and uh, and and uh, form a sort of much bigger um, uh, ecosystem. Um, well. Of- Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Polkadot is already, I feel, kind of rolling out the red carpet for builders and users currently on Ethereum because Moonbeam has these unified accounts which let people use their Ethereum addresses on Polkadot. Um, they also have the same tooling as Ethereum does. And Substrate, of course, makes it possible to use the exact same code that ADAP has on Ethereum, but on Polkadot. Mm. And yet, as you pointed out, there is this strain of tribalism or even maximalism, maybe you might say, in Ethereum. So what do you plan to do to woo Ethereum users and builders to Polkadot and overcome that tribalism? Um, I mean, I, I, you know... One of the big pushes of Polkadot was bridges, and I mean this 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 predates Polkadot. Parity, um, the, you know, did the Parity bridge um, uh, uh, like a, a while before. It was early twenty sixteen. We started work on that, if I remember rightly. Um, so, it, connectivity, uh, trying to bring together different chains, disparate systems into into sort of one functional economy. Um, has always really been something that that I've been interested. In, something that Parity that, that we at Parity have wanted to do, and I, you know, I, I really want to. Um, that's really one of the key sort of features, if you like, of Polkadot. One of the things that it was sort of designed around. Although Polkadot really isn't fundamentally a sort of bridge um, a bridging thing, it is uh, something that bridges can very easily be developed on for, and something that we're already doing ourselves. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I hope that um, bridging and compatibility uh, will be um, r- very key factors in um, in in basically creating a more. It's not you know, it's not about drawing people over necessarily, but creating a more let's say fluid ecosystem, creating a, a very fluid um, uh, meta ecosystem of of blockchain. So you know, people can deploy an application on one chain, but not be constrained to that chain. Um, to then maybe deploy a sort of secondary application in another chain and become a multi-chain app, kind of like a multinational company. You know, the 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 more that we can do to ensure that chains, uh, the applications, that teams don't are not bound into just a single uh, blockchain, the better. And that's that's obviously very important for Polkadot as we are coming at this. Um, as a as a as a you know a relay chain that, that whose main reason of existence is to connect all of these little parachains and 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 also external chains. And would you ever do anything like I don't know liquidity mining or any kind of incentive to attract people to Polkadot? Um, I'm, uh, maybe we'll see. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, Polkadot can only exist if it's useful. Uh, for it to become useful, it needs uh, it needs teams. And so it's not that I, I don't want to like, um, 
I don't want to pretend that that you know uh, it's uh, uh, polka dots the sort of Buddhist monk of the ecosystem that's sort of just going to uh, take a beating and keep on smiling. Um, not not really, uh, but um, but nonetheless, I think there is a um, I, I think there is a, you know a, a sort of middle ground uh, um, that is very um, uh, let's say a, a mutually enlightened self interest position. That allow uh, uh, that allows us to um, that allows basically all of the the chains to sort of come together um, and uh, and cooperate, coordinate, open their ecosystems, and allow kind of like free trade. You know, allow allow people the opportunity to um, to move around, allow teams, the good teams, to deploy across para, across chains, across parachains, across ecosystems. Um, so I, I don't want to say that we're not. We're not going to compete, of course. Com countries within the European Union compete in many respects with each other, but um, you know there are um, there are still really valid reasons for the European Union um, to exist, and I think the same is true um, for um, you know different um, uh, for an ecosystem to be built, a multi-chain ecosystem to be built. So there's also a trend toward transactions that are composable, at least in the DeFi world. And by that, um, we mean that one transaction can include multiple contract calls within a single block. But as far as I understand, in Polkadot, when you send messages between parachains, they can't happen. The, the transactions can't happen in the same block. So there can't be these instantaneous contract calls across shards. And that, of course, then breaks composability. And so, you know, and there are a lot of things like, you know, flash loans or atomic swaps wouldn't really work cross chain. Is composability something that Polkadot is working toward? Yeah. So there's two main, uh, there's two main things. So that, that, that on the face of it is, is right. But there's um, a couple of, a couple of sort of mitigating uh, factors to this. One of them is that um, composability is likely to be mostly a thing within a single chain's ecosystem. So the tightly bound smart contracts um, that do things like flash loans are likely to be within the same DeFi ecosystem, whether it's Moonbeam or Akala or whatever it is. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why you would want um, things to be constrained within a, within a single parachain. Now, the other, the other mitigating factor is that um, ultimately what we want to do is have um, asynchronous um, uh, uh, contract calling. Now, what this would allow basically is for um, in, the, um, in the programming model, in the execution model, it would appear as though um, when, you, uh, when you send a transaction off, it sort of it comes back instantaneously. When you send a message off to make a flash loan, or whatever it is, it comes back instantaneously. But in reality, um, it, it it gets um, the the sort of executing context, the thing that's the thing that's like taking the flash loan, um, actually is halted, is paused for a little a short period of time while the message goes away onto perhaps another chain. Um, it gets executed, the flash loan comes through, it goes back again, carries on executing, and so on. Um, now this requires some some interesting uh, and not entirely trivial um, um, uh, alterations to the computational model. And, and wait, just to be clear. So then that takes three blocks, and so it's like an eighteen second transaction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it may take. I mean, it depends whether it's going all the way into another parachain or whether it's staying within the parachain. Um, but the the and it may take one block. It may take two. It may take three. It's it depends on. A few factors, um, but it may it may be as much as three. Now, this um, the flash like if you know it's not clear precisely what the use cases will be. If it's an Ethereum style flash loan, then yeah, maybe you do want to have it on the single chain. Now, the, it's worth pointing out, of course, that all um, all multi shard architectures will 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 have this issue. Like all multi shard architectures that expect to be able to um, call across shards as easily as they call into their own shard will will have to deal with the fact that um, going across a shard introduces latency it can't be handled within the same block um, so it's not clear how uh, other multi-shard architectures like eth2 uh, are going to handle this either um, eth1 gave everyone a free pass because it's not scalable yeah um, right. if you so if you if you constrain everything into the same blockchain 
like ETH1 does, then problem solved, um, yeah. which is, you know, the, the position that Moonbeam and Akala and Edgeware are already in on Polkadot. If you want to spread things out between chains that operate in parallel to each other and therefore get scalability, um, then you will have to deal with the fact that things don't get processed as a whole in one block. And uh, that's just a that's a fundamental issue with computer science, with logic, <laughs> with maths. You can't you can't get around it by some clever programming trick. Um, but if you introduce things like asynchronous um, calls to it, then you can kind of massage the situation a bit, mitigate some of the issues uh, that, that you might face if um, a, a component that you want to compose with is on another chain. Now, the only other thing I'd add to that is that composability doesn't just... It, Composability isn't about being in the same um, execution environment. There are all sorts of ways of composing things that don't require that. Example, when you want to do an insurance contract, you need an oracle for whatever physical phenomenon it is you're insuring against. The insurer, the, the, that oracle doesn't need to be on the same chain as the insurance contract. It's enough just to provide a proof from another chain that the insur that, that oracle said that the weather was really, that there was a huge storm, um, houses got knocked down in your area like that can be done as a proof you feed it onto the chain um that that is that is providing the financial um whatever compensation and it's enough right there's no need for them to be on the same chain it's only this specific ethereum sort of DeFi where they've made use of the fact that it's all on the same chain and therefore you can do this stuff that all has to be done within a single block um very easily um that's not a limit that's not a fundamental limit. Composability can happen even if it doesn't all happen in the same block. Um, the Web3 Foundation has 30% of all dots, and I'm not sure what amount Parity has, so maybe you can fill us in on that. How do the Web3 Foundation and Parity plan to use their collective stake within the network? Will you participate in parachain auctions, for instance? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no. Um, I, I, we don't have, we don't have, uh, yeah, we have less than that. Um, I don't have the numbers to hand, but it's not, it's not 33. Um, well, we, I, yeah, I mean, according to Masari, that I, that's where I got the 30% uh -huh. from the Web3 Foundation. It was like 29.7% or something. Okay. Well, um, we, I, I, we, uh, a lot of that has been like, so that 30% figure from the original, um, uh, the original document has been eaten into. No, no, no. I calculated it according to the current supply. I did the math on my phone. Okay, the current supply. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm not. Or I'm not circulating sure supply, your, I guess. Math is, but okay. Uh, <laughs> but the, 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 I'll yeah, check it. it. It's substantially less than than thirty percent um, because uh, some of that went to um, companies that are doing that are building polka dot like Parity. Um, some of that, uh, but also like you know. Chain Safe and Soramitsu, and um, some of it went through to grant companies. Some of it went through to auditors, SLA, um, various other SLAs that we have. Uh, that so SLAs are uh, the um, uh, software um, agreements. Um, so, and then of course there's employee buy-in schemes and all of that stuff. So that that all comes out of that chunk um, of, uh, of of dot. But anyway, aside from that. Um, we don't plan on um, on on putting uh, parachains, like purchasing like parachain leases with it. That's not that's not really what we're what we're in for. That's that dot that the foundation is keeping is really just a long term alignment uh, mechanism. So the foundation like has benefit if Polkadot um, does well um, and is able therefore to do more. Um, and uh the main thing it's 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 going into grants it's going into keeping the foundation running which means you know managing um various ongoing legal and regulatory um affairs um continuing to um you know um, manage things like adoption and um, um, outreach and all that kind of stuff um as well as research um so the foundation runs its uh, research outfit um the uh that's the main thing it does do staking but actually relatively little these days um uh it's uh most of that dot most of the staking of that dot the vast majority will end up going to the polka dot um 
the 1000 validator program of Polkadot. So basically um, trying to get as many validators in as possible, build a really good um, validation uh, ecosystem, um, which is um, uh, will soon be, if it isn't announced yet, it will soon be announced, it's right on the cusp. Um, and uh, the Kusama, uh, very similar to Kusama. So uh, the foundation's uh, KSM um, uh, um, stash is also um, much of it engaged in the Kusama's 1000 validator program. Um, yeah, and and it's really, it, we, we try not, we don't tend to vote either. Um, if a vote is down to the wire, then we'll probably take up a tie-breaking position, um, but we try and keep um, we try and keep our dot out of the uh, and, and Kosama out of the sort of general um, um, sort of governance process. Okay, so we're at we're basically at time, but I'm going to just ask you two more questions, um, and let's we'll try to um, keep the answers brief. In June, before Polkadot's mainnet launch, a preliminary draft by the Crypto Ratings Council gave dots a higher risk of being labeled securities, a 4.75 on a scale of five, with five meaning the asset has quote, many characteristics strongly consistent with treatment as a security. Uh, again, this is preliminary. There hasn't actually been a formal rating that's been issued. What do you plan to do to address the possibility that DOTS could be deemed a security? It's our position that DOTS are absolutely not a security. Um, and, um, you know, DOTS are very clearly a utility. Like, you use them to get parachains. Parachains have a very clear um, utility. Um, so we, you know, there is no way that we could imagine a world where dots were labeled as a security. Um, the, uh, you know, these guys take into account lots of factors. Um, one of which was that the dot network was not live at the point that they, um, that they, uh, you know, published this pre-publication <laughs> non-opinion. Um, and um, and that may well have, have contributed significantly to this um, to this not quite score. Um, I I would expect that any later um, reasonable appraisal, um, um, particularly once parachains are launched, um, will be um, quite different. Polkadot enables public and private parachains to interact with each other, and China's blockchain-based service network recently adopted po Polkadot. How do you imagine Polkadot will serve the enterprise world, and how will being on Polkadot, which has this ability to communicate with public parachains, benefit enterprise blockchains? Um, I, th I think connectivity is super important for enterprise, enterprise blockchains. Um, now... I think I might be at ends with a lot of uh, enterprise people, but I'll tell you why. Um, enterprise blockchains are great. They're, they're, they're like the intranets of the early 90s. They, 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 they have a very clear value proposition for um, enterprises in this in this world right now, in this tr sort of traditional mindset. Um, it's like, yeah, you know, you can track what all of your internal transactions are. You can make sure no one is, is cheating on their their audits, you can very easily audit everything that's going on within a company. Um, and, uh, and and that's that level of transparency um, is very, um, can be very uh, sort of um, um, persuasive, um, especially when there, when you're someone at the top who has to, who has to make decisions. And it's kind of difficult to see below one level of management below you. Um, that will work initially in the same way that the old intranet uh, allowed office memos to go back and forth much more easily than you know farting around with bits of paper. Um, but what really made uh, intranets be useful is the fact that the intranet was eventually connected to an internet that allowed offices um, of different companies to send memo memos to each other, like email. Um, and then they start to be able to advertise to each other via the World Wide Web. They start to be able to interact with cons consumers via the World Wide Web and HTTPS. Um, this is uh, this was a super important progression. We wouldn't have had the later stages without that first stage. So I can imagine that enterprises are super keen on building the blockchain for their 
their company. Maybe they're multinational with lots of different sort of arms. Um, maybe they're a conglomerate. Maybe it's actually different companies, but the same overall um, uh, aligned incentives. Maybe the overall uh, owner is the same. Maybe it's between a consortium. So no, no real aligned incentives, but a general assumption that you're kind of working in the same space and probably do want to sort of communicate with each other a lot. Um, but when we eventually get to the point that companies are offering their services through a um, a very minimal cost, um, extremely agile transaction based uh, network that doesn't need any certificates or kind of middlemen or or any additional like visa fees or anything like this, um, when it's literally just business to business doing uh, micro transactions with each other. Maybe it's for data. Maybe it's for permissions to use some particular online system. Who knows? It doesn't doesn't really matter. But when we get to this point, um, that connectivity will be priceless because it will allow composition of solutions. And as we saw with DeFi, composition of solutions is really where uh, the gold is to be mined. All right, great. Well, this has been a, such a fabulous discussion, and um, I hope people really enjoyed it. I did see a few questions about Kusama, and uh, when there just was so much to cover. We didn't get into everything quickly, but I did say it's like the test network, and there is actual live value with their own tokens. So, um, I, you know, hopefully people can read more about it. It, it is very interesting that Polkadot has uh, both of these networks live. Um, Gavin, thank you again so much, and um, I look forward to seeing what happens on Polkadot. Thanks, Laura. It was interesting. Thank you very much, Laura and Gav. And just to clarify on the one point, I can send over the numbers. And I've also updated Masari. The Web3 Foundation is well under half of that 30% that was laid out in the, uh, I think, the early, early, early sales. Um, yeah, it did uh, occur to me maybe Masari's numbers were wrong. <laughs> it's, it's not okay, out of the realm of possibility. You. But thank you both. Uh, have a good one. We'll see you all in the closing remarks. You too. Cheers.